Assalamu alaikum. My brothers, my sisters, I've been reviewing the timelines of many of you in my news feed, both on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And I see that many of you did tune in last night and watch the presidential debate. What I'd like to do is um, I'd like you to give you some food for thought, uh, particularly to the Muslim followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad under the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Understand, first and foremost, I see many of you are upset, if not in the nation of Islam, just black people, that the president would not condemn white supremacist groups, the Proud Boys, or the Ku Klux Klan, or the militias. Did you really expect him to? And if you really expected him to, then where have you been the last three and a half years? Honestly, sisters and brothers, you're going to have to open your eyes and open up your hearts and your minds to the time that we're living in. Not what you wish it to be, but actually what it is. Sisters and brothers, I'm going to give you a, another point of view to the Muslim followers and the honorable Farrakhan. I do see where we have posted, um, of course, out of Fall of America about the national election and what the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said. There's no uh, contradicting those words, but there always must be balance in whatever it is that we present. We cannot be uh, getting ahead of the minister in this wise. He did not say don't vote, but he's not encouraging us to. So we have to take a position, brothers and sisters, that is nuanced in so much as we should not discourage our people from voting. And if we don't feel that Republicans or the Democrats or even a third party is viable, then we shouldn't encourage our people to vote. However, in message to the black man, remember, go to chapter entitled, Put Muslim Program to Congress, and look at what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said about Adam Clayton Powell and another unnamed politician that he said was not afraid to go before the white courts and fight for justice for our people. If we're going to pick a candidate, if we're going to pick someone, we've got to look for someone that fits that mold because those words in the message of the black man are just as strong and viable as the words that are in Fall of America about the national election. So we've got to be balanced and nuance. And remember, the president may not be able to affect you and I, but your mayor, your city council person, your county, your county uh, officials, your state representatives that are going to go and draw the lines after census data come out, the judges, your district attorneys. You see what happened in the Deanna uh, Taylor case about the attorney general in the state. And now it's coming out, brothers and sisters, that he did not present a case to grand jury to have those police officers indicted for the murder of our sister. So you can see that there is a certain aspect of the electoral process that we should pay close attention to. Again, I'm not encouraging you, nor am I discouraging you. I'm only asking you to be balanced in your approach. The Muslims, and to those who are non-Muslims, I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, do not think that the Muslims are just sleeping because we may not be out there doing what you're doing, giving our souls to one party or the other. Do not think that we've been sleeping. Because the truth of the matter is documentation always beats conversation. In this book written by Professor Malachi Crawford in Black Muslims and the Law, there is a, a documented history of Nation of Islam and Muslims particularly in prison, going to the courts and winning many court cases that have changed the, uh, corporal, the, the corporal state. So there's another doc, uh, book entitled Those Who Don't Know Say 
the Nation of Islam, the Black Freedom Movement, and the Carceral State by Garrett Felber. Now, this book, these books simply are saying to us, brothers and sisters, that we have been in the courts changing and getting rights for prisoners are all along. So it's not like we haven't been doing anything. It's not like the Nation of Islam and its lawsuits have not made changes in the society. It's just that your focus is always on integration and what the Civil Rights Movement did, but you pay no attention to what the Nation of Islam did and its contributions to many of the reforms that have taken place inside of the prison industrial complex and even in your everyday life as it relates to law enforcement and black people. Documentation for me always beats conversation. So what concerned me yesterday is, is everyone of course is piling up on Mr. Trump. I mean, what did you expect? But what also concerns me the fact of what Mr. Biden said about working with Republicans and Democrats. What Republicans? Are you talking about the Republicans that you work with in the Senate, Mr. Biden? They don't exist anymore. They're not there anymore. And I always caution us, brothers and sisters, that we've got to understand that any progress that we have made, there's always been pushback. So, what we have here is, of course, what uh, Reverend, Reverend William Barber calls the Third Reconstruction. The Third Reconstruction. The third reconstruction. I always said it always just struck me as puzzled. He's sincere. He's a good brother. And I read this book, and uh, his moral movement is one. But he's recreating almost like the fusion party of my great grandparents in Wilmington, North Carolina, where whites and blacks uh, work together. And in Wilmington, North Carolina, he had a very prosperous black community. So, but there's a third reconstruction. So what happened if we talk about third reconstruction? What happened to the first reconstruction? What happened to the Freedmen's Bureau? What happened to the Freedmen's Bank? What happened to the emancipated uh, enslaved Africans? What happened to them? Do we know that history and how that fell apart? It fell apart, brothers and sisters, because Abraham Lincoln and President Johnson, who took over the presidency once Lincoln was assassinated, Abraham Lincoln, really the Congress, even before and during the Civil War, when the rebellion was going on, was seeking a way to reunite the Union again and to find a way for those Confederate traitors, as you call them today, those who are flying that flag. These people were traitors to the Constitution and shed the blood of their fellow Americans trying to break away in War of Independence, and Lincoln... And Johnson wanted to do pardons and amnesty for these people who wanted to keep our ancestors enslaved. Think about that. And because of their desire for white unity, their desire for the unity, we always suffer. Okay, so you fast forward to the second reconstruction, which is the civil rights movement. I didn't pull out my books on COINTELPRO or the pushback of the conservative movement against the civil rights movement and the Black Power Movement, by the way. But Dr. King, at the end, of, toward the end of his life, there's a book written by Tavis Smiley called The Death of a King, which documents the last year of his life, how those so-called I mark, I march with King, white liberals and Jews and others that always oh, loved Dr. King, walked away from him when he stood up against the Vietnam War and began to try to organize along the lines of economics, regardless of your race, or your creed, the Poor People's Campaign. And when he took his nonviolent movement to the North, those same people that were condemning what Bull Connor and them were doing in the South were the people out there condemning Dr. King and calling them anti-Semite because he pointed out in some of the cases in the North, the slums that we were living in were owned in, were owned landlords with Jewish people. So he called them an anti-Semite when he pointed that out. But Dr. King wrote a book. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? The Civil Rights Movement, for all intents and purposes, were over, and the election of Richard Nixon 
and the ascendancy of George Wallace. George Wallace got a whole lot of votes in 1968 election, brothers and sisters. Don't fool yourself. Okay, so now, where do we go from here? <laughs> well, I want to point out to you, brothers and sisters, that in 1968, the Kerner Commission reported why there was civil unrest in this country. And they came up with the conclusion that we had two nations, separate and unequal. Question, has any of that changed? Yes, we have black billionaires. I wouldn't take anything away from them. Yes, we have stars and athletes. But the question is, what about the masses of our people? Who speaks for the masses of our people? I say it's the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. That's my testimony. That's my witnessing. There hasn't been more consistent voice for black people speaking for the hurt of our masses, unafraid and unapologetically to whomever was offended by the truth that was spoken of the condition of our people and what it would take for them to have full and complete freedom to have equal justice under law, to have equality of opportunity. No one, and I repeat, no one on a national or international platform has spoken more consistently and stronger than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan over these past 40 odd years and over the whole 65 years of his uh, career with the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. But I want to point out to you a book written by the wife and widow of our beloved brother Abdul Hafiz Muhammad out of New York called Black Integration, a Failed Social Experiment. It's worth a read. Go on Amazon and order this book. First of all, because it's good information and she lays out a, a, a cogent and effective argument against black integration. Notice we say a black integration because no matter what, brothers and sisters, America is just as segregated as it was in the time of the 60s. Yes, there are some of us that's mixed in the suburbs. That's, that's true. But I can tell you, brothers and sisters, that some of the inner suburbs, as an urban planner, some of the inner suburbs, the first suburbs, we moved out there once deed restrictions, restrictive covenants, mortgages were given to us, insurance redlining stopped. We moved there, but... What did the whites do? They moved further out. Just look at your own city. Look at your own area. Open your eyes and see. And the same forces that created segregation, individuals, investors, institutions such as banks, insurance companies, mortgage companies, the zoning laws of the, uh, of the uh, municipalities and counties, and land use law, the same ones that did that then are the same ones that are justifying the inner city that most of us are renters in. And that which we see, they come first, they come as one or two of them, and then you see Susie walking her shih tzu or her little poodle and jogging in the hood, and you're like, whoa, where'd you come from? And then there's two, then there's three, then the investors come and buy up the, 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 the houses and the vacant lots. And then you start to see, oh, where did that condo come from? Uh-oh, where did townhouse complex come from? Uh-oh, where did that $200,000, $300,000 home come from? And there's a shotgun shack. This is what's happening in the Houston area. And next thing you know, brothers and sisters, then the Starbucks pops up. Not that we don't like Starbucks. Then the Chipotle pops up. Not that we don't like Chipotle. Then this pops up. That pops up. The next thing you know, they're calling the police on you in a neighborhood that you've been in and ducking bullets in for the last 20, 30 years. Look, brothers and sisters, the same forces that segregated us are the same forces that are gentrifying us today. I wanted to make that point. And in terms of our political discourse, there is a resurgence of black power, and there's some of you that are on this feed who you consider yourself woke. 
and you give no credit to the nation of Islam or the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. Minister Farrakhan is the alarm clock that woke up whoever woke you up. Take it or let it alone. For all intents and purposes, black consciousness, black power was destroyed. You could even see it in the language where we went from saying, say it oh, I'm black and I'm proud, to be describing ourselves as minority. We saw it in the destruction of Soul Train. Look at Soul Train. Soul Train is, is an indicator. That was a, one of the most, go back and see some of those clips on YouTube of Soul Train and the commercials that it was. Johnson products and other black owned products. And you may, you didn't like people break dancing and wearing platform shoes and all that kind of stuff and big froze and all of that. But it was very pro black. Our music was pro black. We were talking to each other. It was a sense of pride, man. We didn't miss Soul Train. We came out and played ball late after Soul Train came on. And we talked about who was on Soul Train Ohio, Player James Brown, Gladys Knight and the Pip, Ike and Tina Turner. I know you don't know some of these folk, but but trust and believe, go back and look at those old clips. That's the beauty of YouTube. I highly recommend it. But there was a convention in Gary, Indiana in 1972, documented by Leonard Moore. I don't necessarily agree with his conclusions. However, the title says the defeat of black power, civil rights, and the National Black Political Convention of 1972 in Gary, Indiana, where I'm telling you the cream de la creme of black struggle, both in the civil rights, integrationist, accommodationist uh, um, group versus those who wanted reparation, separation, and agitation met. And we put all of our balls, listen, we put all of our balls in this political process. And we've elected black people in high places. But look at the condition of our communities. I'm not knocking them. We got some good politicians, honestly. Hard working sisters and brothers. I've worked with them. They have they have been very good to the nation of Islam as far as I'm concerned. But we have to learn, again, going back to that balance, brothers and sisters, we have to learn to give people or grant people their reality, Minister Farrakhan, TZ. They operate in a place we can go. I'll give you an example. Black farmers came to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan as they were being messed over by the government at the time of Barack Obama. And they went to Minister Farrakhan and they asked the Honorable Louis Farrakhan if he could get them to go in and to see the president. The minister said, I don't have it like that, but you should contact uh, Reverend Al uh, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, he the door, if you will, to be able to get to the president. So you have to grant people their reality. Trust and believe, brother, sister, sometimes, you know, when a person is put into a box and they have to look at how they're going to eat, take care of their families, that and the other, and they come out and they say something that may seem to be shade on the minister of the nation or what we believe or what we stand with, you got to understand and walk a mile in their moccasin where they are and what they believe and what they do. But the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, if you look at his track record, he spoke to every black professional group. He spoke to every college. That's how he built the Nation of Islam. And for those of y'all that be saying Mr. Farrakhan robbed us, he robbed y'all. Y'all some suckers. Y'all some losers and suckers. You sound like Donald Trump. Some of y'all black folks sound like Donald Trump talking about us. Minister Farrakhan didn't ask us for a dime in rebuilding the Nation of Islam. I want you to hear me. He went around college campuses. He took the honorariums that he got from his teachers. He mortgaged his home to restart the nation of Islam, to repurchase the books of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad so that his father and our father would be written out of history. And now today, you woke, but you don't even know the alarm clock that woke up, woke you up. Okay, so look, what I want to point out to you, brothers and sisters, is this. We have to be very, very careful because they make promises. And as the Honorable Louis Farrakhan pointed out in terms of these vaccines and these treatments for this COVID-19, the devil promises only to deceive. And I want to turn this on a, a political dime for a minute. And 
the Native Americans or the Indians or the Aboriginal people that were in this continent when Christopher Columbus got here. They had been here for over 16,000 years. And yes, they did come from India. And India is a recent name for the Republic of India. But the Indus River is as old in name as the Tigris Euphrates and the Nile. So that's where they get the name from. Indus. Indians. Indus. But they were enslaved also. They were robbed of their land also. And in this book that we have, American Indian Treaties, The History of a Political Anomaly by Francis Paul Frucha. All of the, look how thick this is, all of these treaties and whatnot. I don't think they kept one of them. Now, there are those of us who say, well, well, minister, you know, separation. Yeah, separation, yeah. But don't think that they ever wanted us here from Jump Street. They wanted to ship all of the free blacks, even at the time of the Constitution. They wanted to ship us back to Africa. So, once this republic was created, they they created something called the American Colonization Society, and this is the genesis of Liberia. How did that turn out? Well, we'll have to look at the condition of Liberia and some what happened, what they call the Marigos, which are blacks uh, that were uh, back there and the exploitation of the Firestone Company with, when it came to rubber and all of that. You got to study Liberia and what happened and the bloody civil war took place. Who did it take place between? Why was it? What happened? We got we to gotta study that. If we want a separate state of territory of our own, we have to study that. We have to study what happened to the Republic of New Africa and see what happened to them and what the government did to them in destroying them. I had a very good uh, relationship with uh, Dr. Amari Obadelli. May Allah forever be pleased with him. He's a professor at uh, Prairie View A&M University. And uh, we, we had a very great relationship. And he used to chuckle when I came up there to speak. But a very deep man. His name is in the FBI files and what they did in the Republic of New Africa and trying to establish separate state of territory within the United States and what happened to them. We should study that, brothers and sisters. We can't just put hashtag separation and not understand the dynamics that it take place. Now, I'll close by saying this. You know, Donald Trump not condemning the Proud Boys and the uh, militias and the Ku Klux Klan. I, I advise you go back and uh, see the 2013 lecture Minister Farrakhan gave on the Muhammad Economic Blueprint. And he talked about our respect for the Second Amendment. We just don't carry weapons because God was wise in guiding us in that way because if we did, they would have a reason to come in and murder all of us, even though that's still in their hearts whether we carry weapons or not. Here's my point. Should we have our own separate state or territory? We don't have to defend it. But right now, in the condition that we're in, man, if you step on my toe, if I borrow $50 from you, I don't pay you, man, you'll kill me, man, you'll kill me for looking crazy at you. That's the mindset that we have of self-hatred that's created such a way, brothers and sisters, that we don't need to have guns in our hands because we don't know how to use it and we'll use it on one another. But I, I do want to point out to us as we go forward that we did build during emancipation over 60 towns, 60 independent towns. And some of these post uh, Civil War towns in this book called uh, The Black Towns, um, it, it highlights five of them. And Nicodemus, Kansas, Mount Bayou, Mississippi, Langston, Oklahoma, in unassigned land, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, Clear, Clear View, and Boley in Oklahoma. Talks about these five black towns where over 90% of the people were black and, and literally ran. There was a movement, a black state movement, 
that's talked about when you talk about in unassigned lands because the five civilized nations in Oklahoma sided with the Confederacy the government came in and they literally broke all of the treaties that they made with the with the Indians uh, particularly uh, after they moved them out of the southeast into what is Oklahoma which was Indian territory Indian country within the United States and so you had uh, Clearview and Boldy in the in the uh, in the Creek Nation, and you had Langston, Oklahoma, in the unassigned lands that were taken from the Indians in Oklahoma, and they created a black state movement that was 29 years before the destruction of Black Wall Street. It's a book called Okaloosa, 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 the story of black state movement in Oklahoma Territory. And the dynamic is very interesting between those who consider themselves black Indians, actually were members of these respective tribes, and how they did not want the blacks from the emancipated slaves from the South to be part of that black state movement. Vision again, always invites murder and destruction into our communities. And again, I always go back to my own roots in Wilton, North Carolina, where blacks and whites worked together, but the white supremacists and the then Democrats conspired and overthrew the government of Wilmington, the municipal government of Wilmington, North Carolina, and 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 literally, uh, my family was scattered to the four winds after that. I can follow them up to the 1900 census, and after that, trading them through Ancestry.com has been has been uh, uh, almost like a 10, 15 year. Uh, odyssey, if you will, for me and my family to find my family and their roots in Wilmington, North Carolina. And then, of course, being in the Southwest region and being the Southwest regional uh, representative, I've gone into Black Wall Street and Tulsa and seen what happened uh, to that beautiful community that we once had. And it was because of envy and jealousy that they destroyed the good that our people did. So, also want to talk about the last post-reconstruction congressman, which was George Waite. And he, with some investors in Philadelphia, bought up some land in southern Jersey, in the tip of New Jersey, in the Cape May County, New Jersey. They named the town after him called Whitesboro, New Jersey. That's where I was uh, sent uh, in my, my high school years to finish high school because I was getting in so much trouble in New York. And speaking of New York, that debate last night reminded me of drinking cheap Boone Farm wine, smoking bad weed, and meeting in PS28, Public School 28 in Manhattan on 155th Street in the school park, and we would do what we was called sapping or playing the dozens. You know what I'm talking about, like wilding out, you know, your mom this and your daddy this and your folks so poor and your mama so fat. That debate reminded me of that last night. We're watching the unraveling of a great nation, brothers and sisters. And as it unravels, we need to be very cautious and careful as to how we approach this. Because America is like a wounded animal. And when you're dealing with a wounded animal, you have to be very careful. Let that wounded animal turn on you. Members of the Nation of Islam, we have to be very careful and sensitive. Our people really believe in this thing. And they believe it's going to turn out well. And they're willing to work another 465 years to wait to have equality in this country. But what happens if it doesn't happen? It doesn't happen? What happens if this is the last president? Maybe, as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan mentioned in his July 4th speech, President Trump, the last president, maybe. Think about it. What you've known, what you and I have aspired for, after watching a beautiful black family in the White House and and in the dignified manner that he conducted himself over those eight years, and then you're watching this, you're watching an assault on the institution of America, and what we've got to be very careful as America is apparently tearing themselves apart is that we don't tear each other apart. So whether you're an integrationist, accommodationist, assimilationist, 
or whether you want separation, reparations, repatriation, let us not turn on one another, brothers and sisters. Those of us in the nation of Islam, let us be very cautious on how this thing goes because they're looking for scapegoat. The ADL condemned Donald Trump for not condemning the Proud Boys or the white supremacists. And what the ADL wants for the militia groups, the Proud Boys, the Ku Klux Klan, they want the same thing for us. We're not the moral equivalent or the immoral equivalent of the Ku Klux Klan, the Proud Boys and these others. That is not what we're about. It's never been about because if it was, then you would see uh, you would have documented acts of violence against members of the Jewish community or white community from us since we're a so-called hate group. But we're not. But trust and believe. The same levers of power that the ADL and the Southern Poverty Law Center and others are pulling to get the FBI to go after those groups are the same levers of power and training of law enforcement they're pointing towards us. So if this thing goes sideways, they're looking for somebody to blame. And those who are calling for us, why y'all ain't in the streets with us? They wouldn't be talking about Antifa and the so-called radical left. They would be talking about the nation of Islam is the one that's sponsoring and a part of this violence that's in the streets. Don't think that we're not guided by a wise man in the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. He's very wise. And so, we want our people to know that in the end, when it's all said and done, when you've exhausted all options, when all else has failed, we're here. We support you. We've marched with you. We've fought with you. We've done all of that. But at a certain point in time, we have to say there is another way. And when that way becomes evident to you when you think there's no way because a perfect storm has arisen and it has led to you and my disappointment in the current political, economic, and social circumstances. There is another way and that's God's way. And so brothers and sisters, I want you to consider this food for thought that we gave you this morning. We love you. We want you to love us back, but even if you don't, we're still going to continue to love you because we follow a man who has the kind of love in his heart that's the love of God. And I'm speaking to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And we will take up the uh, same manner that Master Father Muhammad bestowed upon the Honorable Lord Muhammad when he told him, he said, he told him, take plenty. When it comes to work with our people, you got to take plenty. And we're going to take plenty from you because when you're disappointed and dissatisfied with the outcome of what's going to happen in November and beyond, regardless of who sits in that seat, the Civil Rights Act as you knew it in 1964 has been gutted. The Voters' Rights Act of 1965 has been gutted. We're in a third reconstruction because the first two, we got double crossed. And I will not allow you to be double crossed a third time. We're going to have this conversation and keep having it. Brothers and sisters, this is one black man's opinion. What's yours? I'm Brother Abdul Halim Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum.